Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, we have some friends with uh, BatBNB.com as well as biologists from Fish and Wildlife. Um, I would like to introduce you to them very briefly and they will introduce themselves to you as well. Uh, Emily Stanford is the communications manager at BatBNB.com. Uh, Katie Teets and Lisa Smith are bat, bat biologists. Uh, they're just biologists in general because they have a very diverse portfolio uh, here with Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, I just want to simply plug, uh, we've had a lot of feedback about this particular program. People had other commitments and they were concerned that they would not be able to see this uh, particular presentation live. And uh, do not worry, just go to our YouTube page, which is Couple of Fern. It says President Florida Native Pine Society because it's tagged with my personal uh, president email, but it's just Couple of Fern. Uh, Florida Native Plant Society there, you'll find tons of different um, previous programs. So do not worry, do not stress out. I'm gonna put this into the uh, chat box as well for all you guys to know and subscribe uh, so you guys can stay in touch with us as well as uh, past and upcoming programs that we will do. So um, guys, why don't you introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll go ahead and start. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Sanford, and I'm a representative of Bat B&B, which is a line of bat houses. And I'm a passionate bat conservationist, and I'm excited to talk with you guys today. Um, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Katie Teets, and I'm a bat bio biologist for FWC, or the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, I run the long-term bat monitoring program, where we focus mostly on acoustics, but eventually we'll be adding other data collection methods like mist netting and um, you know cave surveys and things like that. So I'm excited to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Smith. I am also with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission and I'm part of the Research Institute. So I I do a lot of the work studying cave bats. I do a little bit of work with bonneted bats. And then I work with a variety of other cute fuzzy critters like weasels and mink and muskrats. So. You get a little mix of everything. I think you're muted, Mark. Let me unmute myself first. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Emily, would you like me to pull up your YouTube at this point? Um, yes, please. Okay, <laughs> would you like to give people an introduction before I play uh, what they're in for? Yes. So. Uh, so before I started at Bat b, b I used to be a bat researcher and a wildlife filmmaker. And I spent one year traveling, learning about how different cultures view bats. And I put together just this little clip um, from this documentary, The Truth About Bats, to just give you guys a brief introduction to our bat talk, talking about why bats are important and introducing some of the threats they're facing. So thanks. Bat populations are in serious decline in almost every place where they've been investigated. The most serious threat to bats is failure to understand them. That's why people feel they feel they are not really good animals. Bats are of huge economic importance throughout much of the world. Bats actually do a lot for the environment, for the human race. They eat a lot of insects. They eat a lot of the pest insects. The bats at Congress Avenue Bridge, about a million and a half bats during the summer. They're eating about 10 tons of insects every night. And that makes an enormous difference to the number of pest insects that are on the landscape that costs agriculture billions of dollars every year, both in crop loss and in the pesticides. It's been conservatively calculated that bats are saving American farmers almost $23 billion a summer. And you got to keep track of the fact that this is at very reduced numbers, not what they could do if we had full populations of bats. Worldwide, there's a large number of economically important plants that depend on bats for pollination or seed dispersal. Just the tequila and mescal production from agave plants that rely on bats for 
pollination is worth billions annually. Africa has the baobab tree. It's of great ecological importance to Southeast Asia. Bananas, without preserving those bats that they require for pollination, we could threaten one of the world's most important food crops. In Southeast Asia, there's probably no fruit more cherished than durian. Again, it sells for billions of dollars annually. And yet, you can't produce a durian fruit even in an orchard without bats to pollinate the flowers. Many of the most valued timber trees of Australia are dispersed or pollinated by bats. They're incredibly important pollinators as well as them being really important seed dispersers. Literally, just go around the world, name your place, and there's something of big importance that we might lose without bats. But as important as bats are to our lives, we're losing them rapidly. And the main threat is us. Main threats to bats all across the world really start with the habitat destruction. Because of deforestation, some of them are gone. There's other threats as well. I mean, they, the bats get persecuted by people. The main one, yes, deforestation and, and persecution. People don't know about them, so they're a little bit ready to fear them. And Western negative perceptions about bats, it's in our old stories and all our superstitions, all that sort of thing. Although I don't think a lot of people really take a lot of notice of that, but it's in our subconscious. Great, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, so I, You're welcome. Sorry. Wonderful job. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to share this, this section just to kind of give you a background as to how important bats are. They're um, really important for eating pests and in other parts of the world for pollinating plants and for dispersing seeds. Um, but unfortunately, bats do have a bad reputation, because lot, um, especially because of Halloween and their association with vampires and things like that. Um, so as you heard in the documentary, uh, one of the main threats that bat populations around the globe are facing is deforestation, like a lot of our other species. And there are other threats as well, like the white nose syndrome, which our other speakers will get to in more detail later. Um, and also combating these negative perceptions of bats, that they're all rabid vampires. Um, so the most important thing you can do to help these important mammals is other than donating to bat conservation organizations, is installing a bat house on your property. And bat houses are excellent because they not only help with the first issue of combating deforestation, or it doesn't directly combat deforestation, but it provides a habitat that they can safely live in. And um, aside from that, it can also having a bat house on your property can be a great conversation starter for people. They'll say, hey, what's that like weird looking bird house? And you can say, oh, this is my bat house. And like, why would you want bats there? And then you can say, oh, they actually really are very important for helping re reduce pest insects. And so th they can provide an alternative to pesticides. So not only does it work to help directly help the bats have a safe place to live, it also can help change people's attitudes towards them and realize their importance. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of what qualities to look for in a bat house and some specifications about where you can hang it to give it the best chance of success. So bat houses work best if they're against a house actually. And the reason for that is because house walls are very large and they can absorb more heat and make your bat house more thermally stable. Poles work as well. So you can mount your bat house on the top of a pole, but you have to make sure that it's at least, at least 10 feet off the ground. 15 would be better though. And another place that people often try to mount bat houses is on trees. But trees actually are not a great location for bat houses for two reasons. The first is that the branches from the trees provide too much shade, and they also make a, a perch for predators like owls. Like they, so it can turn your bat house into a death trap because they can be w waiting for them to emerge right there. So if you sometimes it's hard to avoid uh, if you have no other good place for it, but if you can avoid trees, that's the best option. And putting on the house is the very best, or the side of the shed. Um, so the most important factors to consider additionally are height from the ground, so about at least 12 feet off the ground so they have space to drop to catch flight. And then the amount of sunlight it receives, this might be counterintuitive because bats are nocturnal animals, 
but they do need the sunlight on the bat house to help warm, uh, or create a warm space for them to live. And it's especially important for nursery colonies. Um, so having a large bat house is important as well because the smaller bat houses that are about this big are just too small to retain ther thermal stability. So you wanna have it about 24 inches high and about 16 to 20 inches wide as well. So the amount of sunlight, the height from the ground, and the third one is, um, yeah, yeah, or, and orientation also affects um, affects it, and away from tree branches. That's the last one. So those are the most important things to consider when you're choosing a location for your bat house, um, and when you're considering what type of bat house to either buy or build yourself. It can be a really fun family project. You want to have make sure it's the proper size, large enough to retain the heat. If you can have a little vents at the bottom, it really helps with creating a temperature gradient so that the bats can move up or down depending on how warm of a day it is. And uh, also ensuring that it's built in a high quality so that it, all the gaps are sealed so it doesn't get moisture inside. Those are all important things to consider. Um, and also if you paint your bat house, it can actually increase your bat, bat house's odds of success up to 50%. And that's because painting it also adds another layer of thermal stability, especially if you're living in the north or somewhere really cold, having a dark color of paint can really help your bat house succeed. So those are my tips for you. Um, one concern we get a lot at Bat B&B is, is guano dangerous to you? And the answer is no, as long as you're not breathing it in and touching it, definitely don't put it anywhere near your mouth as you would with any other like animal feces. It's not any more dangerous than, than bird guano, or sorry, bird poop is. And actually bat guano can be an excellent form of fertilizer and great for your garden. So long as you put it away and use a respirator and gloves whenever you're handling it, it can be a really good, great asset for your garden. Um, if you have any other questions about bat houses, you can always get in touch with me at bat B &B, or support at batbnb.com. I'd be happy to answer your questions there um, or in the comments section of, of this YouTube post. And a final thing I'll add is that um, we're offering a special, bat B &B is offering a special discount for you guys. It's um, so we're giving a 15% off for a, if you use the code bat chat on this. So thanks. Very good. Thank you so much, Emily. We actually have a question for you. Uh, we'll just take it now. Um, in Florida, would putting it in on a shed that gets sunlight all day be too hot, especially if there's That's a great question. Actually, that's you like the temperature to be quite warm. So I went if you were in Arizona or somewhere somewhere that gets over a hundred degrees every single day, then maybe a more shaded spot would be best. But if you have those vents at the bottom, it does really help with the airflow so that bats can choose to move up or down. Um, Dr. Merlin Tuttle, who's one of the biggest bat experts in the world, also recommends you could try having two bat houses and put one in a more shaded location and one in a more sunny one, just to give the bats some more options. And that can help as well because if there are any parasites or predators, they can have more options for moving from one to the other and to give them the better no choice of what works for them best locally for your area. Very good. Thank you so much. So the promo code that uh, Emily is running is BATCHAT. Just go to BATBNB.com. If you have questions that you think about that you want to directly uh, address to Emily, her email address is support at BATBNB.com. And if you want to check out that completely awesome documentary, we just got a taste of it. It is right here and it's also posted in the live stream. So you guys can just simply click on it and uh, watch the truth about that. So thank you so much, Emily. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I do have to jump off because I have another appointment to get to, but I really appreciate you being here. So thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for your time. All right, bye. All right, so let's, so let's uh, get started here. Add. Katie, would you like to go next? Yes, please. <laughs> All right, so uh, a quick introduction. Um, this is uh, general information about bats worldwide, and then we get a little bit more focused into Florida species. 
Um, and then if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and put it in the chat box and uh, I'll attempt to answer it. <laughs> Give me one second to set it up. No worries. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Teets, and I'm the BAT Monitoring Coordinator for FWC. Is it still playing, or did it pause for you guys? It paused. Okay. It's thinking about it. <laughs> Bats are unique in that they are our planet's only flying mammal. Other mammals, like flying squirrels or sugar gliders, only glide, but do not have powered flight. All bats fall into the order Chiroptera, which means hand wing. If you look at the bone structure of a bat's wing compared to a human's arm and hand, you will see that their wing is just like a hand, but with really long fingers. Bats as we know them today have been found in the fossil records from at least 50 million years ago and remain largely unchanged in their structure from that time. Bats are found on every continent except Antarctica and represent almost a quarter of all mammal species with over 1400 species across the globe. You can see in this photo a small sample of how diverse bats can be. There is the small kitty's hog nose bat, not pictured, that has a wingspan of just three inches that barely registers on a scale all the way to the large flying foxes with six feet wingspans. But even those big bats only weigh about 2.5 pounds. Unlike birds, bats do not have hollow bones, but rather just very light bones to make it easier to fly. Bat species around the world have very diverse diets. Some species eat fruit, others eat nectar. Some will go for frogs and fish. Some bats only feast on blood. Others will scoop scorpions right off the ground. For relatively small mammals, bats have long lifespans. Average lifespan for bats is around 20 to 30 years, but have been documented up to 40 years old. Culturally, bats mean different things. In China, for example, bats usually are a bearer of good luck, but most often bats have a somewhat negative reputation. There are several misconceptions surrounding bats. The first being that bats are blind. This is simply not true. People may get this idea because echolocation is used by almost all bat species for navigation and foraging at night, but as nocturnal creatures, bats have eyesight that is adapted for low light conditions. They may not have the sight of an owl, but can likely see better than us at night. There are also differences in bat species as to how well they can see. The bat in the top left corner has much larger eyes than the one on the right with the big ears. This bat with the large eyes feeds on fruit, which is more stationary than a flying insect, and may rely more on visual cues rather than echolocation. Looking at the bat on the right with smaller eyes, we can see that it has really big ears. This bat uses its ears to listen to the echoes from insects moving along tree bark. So while bats use echolocation, they also have functioning eyesight. Secondly, although they may look like flying mice, bats are not rodents. Rodents and bats belong to different mammalian orders. Rodents belong to Rodentia and bats belong to Chiroptera. Next, bats are often associated with vampires. People think that any bat wants to suck their blood. While the, there are vampire species of bats, there are only three of them and they are restricted to Central and South America. There is some documentation that some of these bats are will bite humans, but more often than not, they prefer livestock, other large mammals, large birds, and reptiles. Lastly, rabies is a big fear people have associated with bats. Bats are rabies vector species, but rabies is found in less than half of a percent of bats. In Florida, bats are one of the more common animals turned into 
DOH that test positive for rabies. But often this is the case because you are only coming in contact with sick bats. Raccoons, foxes, and skunks are also major carriers of rabies. But as more conspicuous animals, it's easier to know to stay away. So while bats should be treated with caution and not handled, all bats do not have rabies. Now with those myths out of the way, let's talk about the different types of relationships bats have with plants. First, bats provide several ecological and economic benefits worldwide. They can serve as pest control. In the US, it is estimated that bats save farmers roughly $3.7 billion each year by reducing crop damage and limiting the need for pesticides. Most on average can eat up to half their body weight in insects, while pregnant or nursing mothers will consume up to 100% of their body weight each night. Brazilian free-tailed bats help target an especially damaging pest called the corn earworm moth, also known as the cotton bollworm or tomato fruitworm, that attacks a host of commercial plants from artichokes to watermelons. Bats can also act as pollinators. The role of pollinator is critical for a wide variety of plants, such as the giant cacti and agave, which without bats would not thrive. Bat pollination also plays a vital role in the cultivation of a host of commercial products, including bananas, durian fruit, cloves, carob, and balsa wood. So you can thank bats for your tequila. Lastly, bats can act as seed dispersers. Fruit eating bats play a key role in restoring the vital rainforests that are cleared every year for logging, agriculture, ranching, and other uses. Along with other animals, many fruit eating bats cover vast distances each night, flying across cleared areas, unlike birds. Bats typically defecate while in flight, which helps scatter more seeds across larger areas. Seeds dropped by bats can account for up to 95% of the first new growth. Dates and coffee are some examples of plants that bats help disperse. Bats also use plants as sources of shelter. In the tropics, hardwicks, woolly bats use carnivorous plants as seen in this video. There are also tent making species, such as the Honduran white bat, the little cotton ball in the upper corner, and common tent making bats in the lower corner. Bats will also use other parts of plants as sources of shelter. Here in Florida, the Florida bonded bat has been found using red cockaded woodpecker nest cavities as a roost. A video link has been provided under the quadrant of photos. Other bats, like this Indiana bat in the middle photo, will roost under sloughing bark. Still some bats will roost within the foliage of trees. The top photo shows Formosan golden bats. The lower middle photo shows an Eastern red bat and the lower corner photo shows a northern yellow bat roosting in Spanish moss. Now let's get to know our bats in the state of Florida. We have 13 species of bats that call Florida home. They are the evening bat, the big brown bat, the southeastern myotis, the gray bat, Raffinesque's big-eared bat, the tricolored bat, the eastern red bat, the Seminole bat, the northern yellow bat, the hoary bat, the Brazilian free-tailed bat, the Florida bonneted bat, and the velvety free-tailed bat. Additionally, we have seven incidental species that have been documented only a few times in Florida, but we do not consider the Florida as part of their native range. Oftentimes, these are vagrants that show up from Cuba or Mexico, like the Jamaican fruit-eating bat, or more northern parts of the U.S., like the Indiana bat. Seminole County is in central Florida, and not all 13 species occur in this region. The gray bat is restricted to the panhandle. Hoary bats are uncommon and mostly only present in winter. 
The Florida bonneted bat may creep into parts of central Florida, but they are restricted largely to south of Okeechobee, but work is being conducted on defining the northern extent of the range. Lastly, the velvety free-tailed bat is restricted to the Keys. In general, Florida bats are relatively small. The tricolored bat, for example, only weighs about two pennies, while the Florida bonneted bat weighs about the same as 10 quarters. We do not have any flying foxes in Florida or the United States. Bats have delayed fertilization, meaning that they will breed in the fall, but will not have pups until the spring. Pups are what baby bats are called. All of our native bat species use echolocation and they are all insectivorous. Predators can include owls, raptors, snakes, and domestic cats. Florida bats can be grouped according to their roosting behaviors. For example, the red bat, seminole bat, northern yellow bat, and hoary bats can be considered solitary roosters. This means that they roost either by themselves or in small family groups. Hoary bats are migratory in the northern parts of their range. All of these bats have a furry tail membrane that act as a blanket when they're roosting. The mothers will take the pups with them when they are foraging and they'll roost in Spanish moss, palm fronds, foliage, and leaf litter. Another group of roosting behaviors is called the colonial roosters. These species include the evening bat, big brown bat, southeastern myotis, Brazilian free-tailed bat, raffinesque's big-eared bat, and the tricolored bat. These species tend to roost in small or large groups. Winter roosts are typically differ different from summer roosts. So the males and females ro will roost together in winter, but in the spring, females will break off and form their maternity colonies. Mothers will leave the pups at the maternity colony when foraging. And these species will typically roost in caves, tree cavities, or man-made structures. These are a few examples of man-made structures. Culverts, bat houses, bridges, and abandoned buildings. Given bats' difficult nature to study, they're nocturnal, they fly, and they're cryptic or hard to find, there are still a lot of unknowns about some of the most basic life history traits or population trends. To answer many of the questions we have so that we can better understand our bats and conserve them, FWC is leading several bat conservation efforts across the state, many in collaboration with other agencies, universities, private landowners, and nonprofit organizations. We have the Long-Term Bat Monitoring Program, which is about two years old and mainly my job. We also do white nose syndrome surveillance. We have various Florida bonneted bat projects. We participate in the Florida Bat Working Group and the Florida Bonnets and Bat Working Group. We also conduct culvert and cave surveys. We monitor the bats in the Withlacoochee Caves Critical Wildlife Area. And we also have a tricolored bat roost finding project. You may be asking yourself, how can I help bats? There are lots of ways you can do this. You can be a bat backer by letting your friends know why bats are important and how they help humans. I provided some helpful links here. You can also be a bat guardian by reporting unusual behavior to your regional FWC office, either online or over the phone. And you can also be a bat host by building and installing a bat house or by preserving natural roost sites, such as trees with cavities and peeling bark or dead fronds on palm trees. If you have any additional questions, you can always contact your regional FWC office or visit our BAT page. Seminole County's regional office is in Ocala, which is circled here. A last thing I wanted to mention is the BAT Week website. This website has a lot of information on bats and lots of fun activities you can do at home to learn more about the bats. Bat Week is usually held in the last week of October each year. Due to COVID-19, 
activities are virtual. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and thanks for your interest in BATS. Yay, that was awesome. <laughs> Holy cow, that covered, that covered it all. Wow. Um, so Lisa and Katie, I put up some information about batweek.org into our chat box and folks, it's right here, uh, https slash slash batweek.org. And then if you wanna support Florida Fish and Wildlife, it's also in the chat live stream. You can go to myfwc.com slash get involved slash support FWC. And if F Florida Native Plant Society and Cup of Fern is for you, you can go to fnps.org slash join where they'll give you all the information and then you can select a couple of firm from the drop down. Uh, we serve the Central Florida community. So in case you happen to be the area that we serve, please go ahead and uh, join. So that way you guys can uh, get in on the fun per se. Um, so I have a question from Char C. I believe this is for Katie. Great information and resources. By any chance will bat eat my butterflies and or butterfly caterpillars? That's a good question. Uh, most of our species will not eat butterflies or caterpillars that I know of. Um, they tend to go for moths because um, they're not moths are nocturnal and butterflies are usually um, diurnal or active during the day. Um, and they'll also eat uh, mosquitoes, beetles. Um, some species eat spiders. So your butterflies and your caterpillars should be safe. Great question. I'd like to uh, add on to that question. So many people believe that butterflies are great uh, controllers of mosquitoes. However, um, is that true? Do you find that out in the field where their bellies are full of mosquitoes or do they prefer some um, other sort of insect? Are you talking about butterflies or, or bats? <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, it'd be really cool <laughs> if butterflies eat mosquitoes too. Uh, no, um, it depends on the species that you're looking at. Um, larger bodied species will or of bats will eat larger insects, and then the smaller bodied um, bats will eat those smaller insects, if I said that correctly. Um, so, yeah. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but I know that um, there's this, I think it's evening bats that their pregnant mothers will eat 100% of their body weight and they are one of the species that really like insect or um, mosquitoes. So, yeah. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right. With that, I'd like uh, Lisa to take over. Lisa, if you'd like to introduce yourself and I can add in your presentation here as well. All right, well, now that Katie made all of you an expert on Florida's bats, I'm gonna teach you a little about, bit about what we've been doing in the research side of things at FWC, and Katie touched on some of that. So, and just a quick plug for Florida State Parks, this picture here is from Florida Caverns State Park up in Mariana, Florida. So if you're ever up that way, we have some really gorgeous uh, formations in the case up there. So as I mentioned earlier, I do a lot of work with uh, whiteness syndrome of Florida cave bats. And many people don't know that Florida actually has a lot of caves. So we estimate there's around 600 air-filled caves that bats can use in Florida. And these are mainly concentrated in two regions in Florida. That's this region up here. This is like Jackson County, about an hour west of Tallahassee. And this region in here, and this is a lot more spread out, you know, this is Gainesville, Ocala, uh, like the Withlacoochee State Forest area. So even if you don't know it, we have a lot of caves and therefore we have cave bats. And we estimate there are three, are three cave hibernating bats in Florida, the tricolor bat, which is Florida's smallest bat. And that's this little guy here, if you can see my cursor. And the southeastern myotis, which is a slightly bigger bat right next to it, and the gray bat. And all these species are of greatest conservation need in Florida, and the gray bat is a federally endangered species, and the tricolor bat is a candidate for federal listing. 
And these bats rely on caves because they provide stable above freezing temperatures and that provides good conditions for torpor or how they lower their body temperature in winter so that they can save energy when bugs are less abundant. And we're really interested in them because of white nose syndrome, which if you haven't heard of it, it was first detected in uh, winter of 2006, 2007 in New York. And this is a fungus that's caused, uh, we call PD for short, a lot easier to pronounce than that. And it actually wasn't even known that the definitive cause of white nose syndrome was this fungus until 2011. And this disease affects more than, or can affect perhaps uh, half of North America's 47 bat species that use caves when they hibernate. And in, uh, right now we know it affects eight species, two endangered and one threatened. And the mortality from this disease varies from species and the site, but it can wipe out entire hibernaculae caves. And this is an old estimate, but they have estimated that over 6 million bats have died of white nose syndrome. And then, so I have a, there's a lot more information on whitenosesyndrome.com and it's our .org and it's located right here. I'm gonna show you a, give you a quick tour. Oh, on my other screen. So um, this will tell you what it is, uh, what bats have it, where is it? We'll give you a lot more information about what people are doing to work on it, uh, what you can do to help. The, one of the big things here is if you go to a cave in another state and you come to Florida, you wanna make sure you don't wear your same clothes, shoes, anything into a cave in Florida that you've worn outside of Florida because you could bring the disease to uh, Florida. And they have, if you need to wear the same clothes into a cave, they have decontamination protocols right here. So anything you need to know about white nose syndrome is located on this webpage. And they also have a white nose video game, which I tried and I'm very bad at, And but it's a lot of fun. If, you know, you got kids at home want to give it a try. And then, so the real reason I wanted to show you this is to look at this webpage here. And this gives you an idea of how fast white nose has spread in the US. So here's where white nose originated. And then you can see as it grows every year, it gets further and further and further and it's coming towards Florida and spreading west. And then this just really is spreading rapidly. And then it jumps out to Washington state. Now it's in California. Um, so gives you an idea. But if you notice right here, Florida still appears to be white nose free, but they have it pretty far south in Mississippi, about mid halfway down Georgia and Alabama. So it's creeping up on Florida and we're quite concerned about that. Uh, the other notable thing is when it jumped to Washington state, they actually did genetics on the fungus of the bat. And they found that uh, that was actually the same strain of white nose that was on the East coast. So it was probably transferred by a human to the other coast. So just to let you know how can you know how this can spread so quickly and how people are playing a role in the spread of the disease. So back to the presentation. So what are we doing about it at FWC? Uh, back in 2014, we started uh, our white nose uh, projects, and this includes multiple things, including population monitoring. We're looking at how the bats are doing and where they are. Then we're conducting surveillance, and that is looking for physical sign and swabbing and working with uh, partners out of state. And we're conducting research on bats and the movement of bats that could help inform white nose. And we're also working to educate the public on the dangers of the disease and helping protect vital roos. So to expand on that a little more, since 2014, we have surveyed over 160 caves in Florida. And these are on public and private land. So we have a lot of really great partners that have let us come out to their properties and take a look around, see how the bats are doing. And when we're out there, we are following all the federal decontamination protocols that are listed on whitenosssyndrome.org. And we're also working hard to reduce disturbance. So we try to limit our time in the cave. We use a red light and we're very quiet. So, you know, hopefully we don't impact bats too much. And then I have a video of a cave in Florida. We'll see if I can get it to work. So I don't very often have videos in caves because of the disturbance factor, but this area of this cave did not have any bats in it. So 
This is one of my favorite caves. It has these really long stalactites. And it's not super obvious here, but there's a breeze in the cave and it causes all the columns to kind of lean in a certain direction. And there you can see some people looking around and we're wearing those Tyvek suits to prevent the movement of the fungus. Oh, all right. And so since 2014, we have found that tricolor bats are one of the most uh, frequently detected bats in Florida caves. So we have found them in over a hundred of those caves that we've surveyed. And they usually roost by themselves, but they can also roost in small clusters. And you'll see these guys and they look all wet. And that's because caves are really humid. So when they're in torpor, they can actually collect dew on the outside of their body. So it's pretty, pretty neat to see. But of all the caves we surveyed, we only found two caves that had over 100 tricolor bats in it. And we found that eight caves contain over 50% of all the bats that we counted during our surveys. But the other 50% are in smaller caves, so in a lot more caves. So why small caves seem like they might not be important because they only have one or two bats in them. Cumulatively, they actually support a large portion of the population. And because they're dispersed and in so many different caves, we're hoping that if white nose syndrome comes to Florida, that we will, uh, you know, our bats will be a little more resistant because they're not roosting in large groups together. Then our other bat is the southeastern myotis. And these bats are highly variable. They're really, really rely on cave roosts in the summertime where they're, you know, the caves that are hotter have water under them to protect them from predators. But in winter, they seem to move out of the caves and they go probably to tree roosts or to bridges or culvert roosts, probably so they can spread out on the landscape and take advantage of the more limited resources. But occasionally a cave, well, so there's one in particular that seems to be the most unpredictable. Sometimes we will get 40,000 bats in winter and sometimes we'll only have a couple hundred. So sometimes they stay in winter and sometimes they move off. So it's kind of an interesting thing to see. But we also do get single individuals in smaller colonies of usually zero to 50 or one to 50 bats in each hibernacular we find them in. And these bats don't seem to rely on torpor as much as tricolor bats do in winter. So when conditions are good, they're going outside and eating. And um, this may help them be a little more resistant to white nose syndrome. So that's all good for that species. And I have a video that's taken with a red light this is when one of the cave I was telling you about that can have up to 40,000. And you can hear them chattering. Even if we're really quiet and using red light, the bats still kind of get stirred up by us being in there and they fly, they'll fly around a little bit, but they still right back down. But it's a really awesome phenomena to be in there with the bats. And with all these 40,000 bats, there is also probably 40,000 cockroaches so it is both really disgusting and really awesome. But we got out of there pretty quick so we didn't disturb them too much. You can see most of them are still roosting on the rock. It's a little hard to see there. But the whole wall will be covered with bats and they can actually fit 2000 bats inside one square meter, which is how we get an estimate for the size of the colony because clearly you can't count that many bats very quickly. So one other bat we found that we didn't expect to find is the Raffiness figured bat. So this is a really cool bat because they just have such big ears. And when they hibernate, they actually tuck their ears under their wings to keep them warm so they don't get frosted or anything. And they're rare in Florida, but they can be found throughout most of the state. And uh, they, in the south, they usually roost in structures in wintertime, like bridges or in tree cavities. But in the northern portion of the range, they do commonly use caves. This is the only bat we've ever found in a cave in Florida of this species, and we only found it once. So I guess it, they move a lot and winter to different roots. So I guess he moved on. And one of the other cave bats that I mentioned earlier is the gray bat. So as Katie mentioned, this is the southern extent of their range, and they're known to spend winter in only two hibernacular caves in Florida. And they use different caves in summertime than wintertime because they have different requirements for the temperature that they need, like really warm caves uh, in, when they're breeding and cooler caves when they're hibernating. And in these two caves that we know them in, they're historically in pretty large numbers, but they received a lot of disturbance 
and a lot of the bats abandoned. So in the bigger hibernacula cave, they were able to protect it in the early 90s and the bats briefly rebounded. But since then they continued to drop off in numbers. And the last time they saw any gray bats in a Florida cave was in 2011. And we believe that they are now extirpated from Florida. So we don't think they're here anymore, but they are doing really well in the rest of their range and increasing. And we think one of the reasons they might not be in Florida anymore is because historical disturbance may have pushed them out of the preferred hibernaculus. So they moved to some Florida caves for a little while, but then they ended up when the other caves are protected, moving back to the original cave. So hopefully they're doing great elsewhere. And so part of our research was looking at what makes a good hibernacula. So we can try to identify caves that bats really like so that we can protect them. And Florida is pretty hot. So having a cave where it's a cooler temperature where bats can lower their body temperature and enter torpor to save energy in the winter is really important. So we found more bats in these caves that are cooler or more tricolor bats at least. And they seem to like caves that have lots of passageways. So really long caves and these long caves maybe have a more stable microclimate inside, further inside. And it also may have different temperatures within the cave. And we know that bats will actually require a different temperature at different stages of hibernation. So they'll move and follow these temperature profiles to different areas in the cave. So that may maximize their energy savings. And they also preferred caves with one single large entrance and domes and solution holes. So a dome is like a big domed room and solution holes are like those smaller, uh, kind of like a pipe going up into the ceiling. And these areas can actually allow them to stabilize the temperature of the cave, especially when you pack a bunch of bats in there, they'll warm up the area and it will be very stable. And depending on how they're distributed within the cave, they will have different temperatures. So again, when they're trying to follow an ideal temperature, they might find that the inside a dome or a solution hole, they get a preferred temperature. And they also preferred caves that had big bodies of water. And this probably really benefits them because it increases the humidity. So when they're hibernating, they won't get, you know, they're not drinking water a lot. So they need to conserve all their water and, uh, you know, they won't get desiccated as quickly. So a quick summary of some of the things bats are looking for. All right, and then part of our white nose work, I mentioned we're doing surveillance. So one of the things we do in every cave we go in is we look for a white fungus growing on the bat's muzzle or wings. And we look for odd behaviors. Are they flying when they shouldn't be flying? Or are they roosting in the daylight near the entrance? Which, disclaimer, Florida bats kind of do that anyway. But, and we're, you know, just making sure they all look healthy and good. And then if we have a bat with a fungus or that looks suspicious or we're handling it for some other reason, you can use a UV light and it will actually cause the fungus to fluoresce. It's not 100% guaranteed because other funguses will also fluoresce and some bats that have the fungus don't fluoresce. So, but it can help be a useful tool to con consider. But the most effective thing we do is swabbing. So we work with the USGS Wildlife Health Center to swab a number of our roost caves in Florida. So this is great because we don't have to handle them. We just go rub a little cotton swab on their nose and up and down their forearm and send it off to the lab. And we focus on roosts that get a lot of human traffic, like tour caves or recreational caving caves, and uh, also caves that have a lot of bats. And sometimes we end up taking, if there's not enough bats or we can't reach them, we collect soil samples as well and send it to the lab. And we're surveying about eight sites for that. And recently we've incorporated swabbing bats at bridges and culverts because more species of bat that are susceptible to the disease will use those roosts in Florida. And as of last year, last winter, we saw no physical sign of white nose, none of our bats. So we tried UV fluorescence on fluoresce. All our swab and soil samples were negative. So hooray, we believe we are still white nose free and we are the only state east of the Mississippi River that can say that. So we're pretty excited, but we're still trying to be prepared. All right, and then, well, I'd ask you a question, but I don't, nobody can really answer. So here's a variety of things. And what do these have to do with bats? 
And what do they uh, have to do with white nodes? So they all have one thing in common, and that is that they are all used to try to develop treatments for white nose syndrome. So for example, there's a, pineapples have a natural fungus in the, or antifungal in the little grooves between the little pineapple, I don't know, whatever you call the little, these little grooves here have antifungal. So people are looking on using that to reduce the fungal load in bats. Uh, they're looking at this volatile organic compound that delays the ripening of bananas. So something that could be used to treat white nose syndrome. There's actually an ingredient in laxatives that's uh, used to help delay fungal growth as a potential treatment to the cave. And then uh, shrimp, they extract it, chitosan is extracted from the shell and that has been found to have a lot of antimicrobial and antifungal features that could be used in treatment. And then jellies are uh, being looked at as a way to apply vaccines to bats. So just real quick, again, here's some more. Everyone always asks about a vaccine and vaccines are a great idea, but you still have to find a way to get this on all the bats. And it's really hard to apply something in a cave to bats without affecting other sensitive animals in the cave ecosystem. So that's why, where the jelly comes in. And they're also looking at spraying it on bats as they go in and out. Another exciting thing that uh, people are looking at is UVC lighting. And they've actually found that this can get rid of the fungus, but you have to be able to apply it to bats for 28 seconds. And other um, maybe iffy things people are trying are altering the climate of the cave, so making it warmer or colder to benefit them. Um, there's several cleaning agents people are looking at. and. Uh, a quick summary of some of the treatments, but we don't have a treatment that can be widely applied quite yet available. So we're also doing some other research. And uh, one of the things we're looking at is the microclimate of the cave. So if you look at this, that purple line is the temperature of the cave and the black line is the temperature of the external temperature. So you can see how much the temperature varies outside and how stable it remains in the cave. And white nose grows best at cooler temperatures between 12.5 and 15.8 degrees Celsius, which this cave is a myotis cave, so it's actually pretty warm. So it's not in that range very much, but we have several caves that are in that range, which means the fungus will grow faster. And they can grow up to temperatures kind of around 19 degrees, but even if it gets hotter than that, it won't kill the fungus, it just won't grow anymore. We're doing a lot of research looking at cave temperature, and I'm gonna speed up because I got a lot more slides for you guys. And then we're looking at, oh geez, you guys see that? Did I, oh, I think I just undid one of my screens. All right, so we're also looking at how bats are moving because we wanna know if bats are uh, how, you know, migrating to Florida, mainly the tricolor bat. Most often people think of this bat as a resident bat species, but we don't know for sure because it's really hard to track bats when they're uh, migrating. So, if you put a transmitter on them, you have to catch them. It puts a little burden on the bat. And then they don't have very good radius on the transmitter. And you have to track the bats really far and it's really hard. And you can try banding bats to look at how they're moving, but you have to be able to find them all again. So recently we've been working on a study that uses isotopes. And we're using hydrogen isotopes. And these work by uh, the isotope will actually change at different latitudes and altitudes, and it's very predictable and it can be mapped. So when a bat is growing their hair, they're consuming water and bugs, and this will record the hydrogen levels of where they are in the summer. And so we captured bats at caves, and then we removed a little bit of hair, and we sent it to a lab to figure out roughly where our bats come from in the summer. And here's some quick maps. So the bats likely came from the dark blue area and the cave they were sampled at is located at the little X. So um, you can see that one on the left is a local bat. I mean, it's a very rough scale because Florida doesn't have a lot of elevation change, but uh, that bat likely spent its summer in Florida, which means it wouldn't naturally bring the disease in. But if you look at the screen on the right, that bat likely came from somewhere much further north either in the Southern Appalachians, I mean, even up as far as Wisconsin. So this bat could very well have interacted with white nose syndrome positive bats and bring it into Florida. 
But luckily, most of our bats are local and only four bats made those really large latitudinal migrational movements that could bring in the disease. And so that was I mean, good to know most of our bats aren't moving, but we are not free of natural transmission of the disease. And then we're also looking at bat use of culverts. So we're a little culvert gremlins, we're crawling under the road. And um, we're like, interested in this because bats can use them in winter. They can use them in summer as a maternity colony or a bachelor roost. But most importantly, because culverts are a way that you can actually apply a treatment to uh, all the bats that are if they're fit, infected by white nose without impacting other sensitive species. And they also may provide a movement corridor because there's really not many caves between our caves in Florida and the caves in Northern Georgia. So we want to know how bats might bring the disease into Florida so, and how bats are moving in culverts. And we can also help work with DOT. So if they're doing any road work, they can be aware of some of the issues of the bats, especially hibernating bats in culverts. So I got a real quick game for you guys. Uh, probably works better in person, but we'll make a go at it. We're going to try to find some bats so you can see what we're seeing. So first of all, spot the bat. Um, it's kind of similar to what it looks like in a cave. And they're all in the joint of that culvert. So that one's pretty easy, but these bats are really cute. So, And then I have this one. This one's a little more obvious. You can see I'm using, he's again in the joint of a culvert. There he is tucked up in there. And then we have this one. You're looking at where he might be. You might think that dark spot in the top center. But that's actually mud daubers. But bats also roost like that a lot. So, and here's another glorious culvert and might look like there's no bats in here. But when you get closer, we've got one roosting on a wee pole uh, on some duct tape. And this was another hard one. You may see a bird nest, but no bat. And here's my favorite Stella Luna bat in a culvert. And pretty much we have found that uh, myotis are in culverts around 50% of the time, give or take a little. Tricolor bats are in the uh, culverts a lot less, maybe 20% to 10% actually varies a lot with years. But there are a lot of bats in there and they're actually in there mostly in winter, but some myotis will stay and use them in summer as maternity col colonies, but it's much more rare. All right. I have too many slides for you, so I'm going to go even faster. Um, we've been doing work with the Florida bonnet bat for six years, and people seem to be really interested in bonnet bats because they're Florida's biggest bat, and they're only found in Florida, and they're also really cute. And I'm a small piece in this larger project. It takes a lot of people, and they're working on various different aspects of the species biology. Uh, Katie went over this earlier. Uh, they're very large. Um, they have like little ears that make a bonnet. They don't migrate. And that's our little range or what we know of the range in red. So it's just we've done a lot of different work and I want to let you guys know you are listening to the world's leading expert in bonneted bat coloring. And that is because not that many people study coloring in bats. And this is the north of, rarest bat in North America. So carve myself out a little niche. Um, and what we've seen is both these bats on the left can be kind of gray or kind of brown. They don't even look like the same species. It's actually when the bats, we've been seeing some hair loss from some of the roosts and when they grow their hair back in, it comes in gray. So it's kind of interesting, but more excitingly, we've seen these hypopigmented marks there on their belly and they can be different shapes. They can be a triangle, they can be like a chevron, they can be a circle, just a dot. They could be completely brown. And this varies throughout the range and it's most common in the population near Port Charlotte and less common in the population down near Miami, but it doesn't seem to affect their survival, which is kind of cool, but we're not quite sure why it's happening. We thought it might be a result of inbreeding or some genetic deficiency, but so far that doesn't seem to be the case. So still a lot to learn there. Um, there was a graduate student with UF who did some work on where they are and what they kind of habitat they select. So she put out a lot of acoustic monitors and detected them throughout. You can see the southern half of Florida there and all the black dots. And what she found is the bonneted bats are associated with agriculture, which is really a surprising find, but they're not as commonly found in developed areas. So here are the three main populations that she found them in. So the big whole South Florida area that's very protected, 
the kind of Port Charlotte area that I mentioned earlier. And then up above Okeechobee there in Avon Park Air Force Base has a lot of uh, food from Bonnet and Bats, which is pretty cool. And then we found that they're really hard to catch to study because they fly really high. So one of our researchers at FWC found that you could actually play the sounds of bonneted bats and they would come in. So they did a study and they found at sites where they didn't use an acoustic lure, they caught zero bats. And when they used an acoustic lure, I think they caught about 18 bats, which is really exciting because nobody could catch them before. And here's a quick video of people setting up a mist net. Takes a lot of people, a lot of supervising going on there. I think they're actually setting up too. So it's, I don't know, pretty fun and involved uh, procedure. And uh, the net is really fine, so the bats can't see it very well. They, they do know it's there, but hopefully not in time to avoid the net. And then once we catch them, we can get them out of the net and look at their gender and other things like that. So we've learned a lot about bonded bat reproduction the last couple of years. We've been working with Zoo Miami, who's been doing ultrasounds on bats. You can see that bat down at the bottom is very, very pregnant. And um, we didn't know anything about it before the study. And then we found out the pups are actually present in the boxes from April to December. And we think they might be able to have two pups during the year. And this has resulted in some changes to the bat exclusions in South Florida. And that baby bat, this being held in the hand there actually weighs the same as a Brazilian free-tailed bat, even though it's very young. Uh, then we've learned about their social structure. We think these bats have a harem and usually there's a dominant male and maybe 10 to 15 other bats, but we've had much larger roosts. And the males will actually defend the roost, which is kind of cool little note. And then uh, how do we know all this? We've been doing a big study at Babcock Web with pit tag readers. So we actually pit tag the bats, much like people pit tag dogs and cats. And then we have a reader on the box and we can tell when the bats are going in and out and which bat they are. So hopefully in years, we'll figure out how long they, they live. And there's a lot of cool information we're working on to glean from that. Also been able to put some GPS tags on bats where we found the bats forage more in orchards and tree farms and pasture and row crops, which is, you know, really kind of complements the previous study that found that with acoustic information. And that we're finding that females fly further from the roost. They have larger home ranges. Uh, and yeah, so they're out there flying around more. And the males, since they defend the roost, they'll come back to that box more during the night and they don't stray as far from it. And diet, this has come up before. So there was a grad student at UF. Uh, she went out and collected guano from a couple areas in their range during different months of the year. And they found that they eat large and hard prey, so like moths, beetles, crickets. And um, they also detected several agricultural pests in the diet. And uh, so they could have a lot of benefits for farmers in Florida. And prior to some work in, with tree roosts, we I think have maybe like only a handful of known roosts but they've been able to track bats back to the roost and locate 19 additional roosts, which is really important for protecting them is knowing what we need to protect. And they found them using live pines, uh, dead pines, cypress trees, palm trees. So they had one bat that had up to 84 bats, which is a huge number. So it's pretty exciting. And they've also looked at how fire affects bats. So you know, they put out acoustic monitors for the study and they found that the bats actually respond positively to prescribed burning, especially if they're conducted every three to five years. That was a really quick summary. Sorry, kept you guys all really busy. And this is an adorable video that I may have trouble playing since I disabled my other screen on accident. But oh, there we go. So here's a video of some bats leaving the roost at night. And uh, this is by Ralph Arbord out of Florida. And one of them actually has a transmitter on them, so keep your eyes open. And I'll end with this with that because they're just the cutest, coolest little bat. Amazing! Oh my God, I am blown away by both of your presentations. Um, 
folks, I think you guys, our viewers are equally blown away. This is a good time to comment in the chat box in the live stream with your questions. We'll be happy to take them. Um, my question as a native plant enthusiast, it was very good to know that uh, especially the uh, bonneted bat responds very well to agriculture in South Florida. Um, however, here in Florida, we know that many of our plant communities uh, are reliant on fire. And you touched very briefly on that towards the end of your presentation on fire regimen and the importance of fire management. Uh, can you tell uh, a native plant enthusiast like me how bats are positively impacted by that? I'm, I'm trying to make that connection. Uh, they think that like the way the fire regime works will actually change the insect communities and have more prey available for them. Um, but I was gonna say those uh, papers that I would, I'll duck under the desk and <laughs> get the smiler screen running. I will actually provide more information that was re research was done by a colleague of mine at the research institute. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have some other questions as well while Lisa uh, gets some information. And Lisa, uh, no need to go above and beyond. If you have it, you have it. Um, so Peter, let's take the first one. Peter writes, does lighting have any negative impacts on bats? Katie, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, so that is a yes and no answer. <laughs> so. Uh, lighting in general for wildlife tends to have a negative effect because if you're active at night and there's lights um, that are on, your predators are going to be able to see you a lot more easier when there's lights. Um, but at the same time, uh, bats can be attracted to street lamps and other things that attract their prey species. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag. <laughs> Good to know. Um, let me add another question on the screen. Elizabeth writes, is there a certain time of the year that is best to set up a bat house? Would you guys be able to touch on that? But because we are more reliant on natural or culverts, et cetera, and I feel like bats tend to figure out what temperature uh, zone they're most comfortable with and they gravitate to that. Lisa, do you have an idea? <laughs> um, it depends what you're going for. I think if you put them out kind of in late winter for maternity colonies, you just want to have it available when they start looking for that. It still may take a couple of years, but a lot of what I've seen, at least around Gainesville, is a lot of bats in Florida actually are more likely to use bat houses, the smaller ones in winter time. So, and then they go back to their maternity roost. So if you get, I mean, I think any time, it might still take a couple of years, but if you put it up in June, you probably miss the maternity season. <laughs> Understood. So are you saying that uh, colonizing bats will use the bat house just uh, for mating or for refuge purposes, and then they'll go back or find a more suitable colony elsewhere? Yeah, there's a lot of roost switching, and it depends on the species, I think, and like the location, because some species will migrate like regionally, especially like in North Florida, like the free tailed bats will move further south sometimes in winter. I see. That's I think, good yeah. So, good yeah, I think those, uh, the bats that like to go in the bat houses, uh, I've seen this with Brazilian free tails it's easier to be warm in a bat house during winter than it is in a bigger like you know like a bridge or something like that that's always in the shade because the bat house is being um hit by the sunlight directly during the day I see. I see good question peter thank you so much um and then elizabeth i think we just answered your question is there a certain time of the year breeding season so november now is a good time uh, Matthew Hopkins writes, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, folks. We had great interest in this presentation, and I'm so pleased to see our viewers really tune in. I'm sure many more will tune in and watch our 
YouTube video uh, afterwards as well. Um, part of my reason why I wanted uh, to engage with Fish and Wildlife and uh, Back BNB and other affiliates was because uh, we get this question a lot, believe it or not. Uh, you know, we are plant enthusiasts, but people want to, you know, take it one step further and see how they can help biodiversity in their local neighborhood or just their garden. So this was really a cool presentation. Um, Elizabeth writes, uh, you mentioned the smaller bat houses may be more attractive. Does size have an issue at all? Uh, have you seen a difference between larger and smaller? Um, no, it, it kind of just depends on what the bats want to do. Because <laughs> um, yeah. UF has those huge bat houses that have thousands of bats in it. And then I've been in a state park that had a teeny tiny bat house that was built by a yeah. Boy Scout and there were bats in there too. So yes. it just kind of depends. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, very, very true. They have those, they look like uh, little sheds yeah. on a stilt. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they exit out of their house uh, just during sunset, it's a sight to see. Mm -hmm. Millions upon millions of them. Um, all right, I will float over to okay, uh, Lisa. Do you have anything to share with us? Uh, so I was just say, as far as bat houses go, there's the traditional ones that people see, and like our bonded bats really like the single chambered bat, bat houses, so that might be considered a smaller one. And, but uh, rocket boxes are a different style of box and they're very long and skinny and those are more ideal for like maternity colonies. We put one up at our office a year ago. It doesn't have any bats in it yet though. But. Yeah. And we made it so you can also make your own bat box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen, uh, I've seen those rocket style bat boxes. They're very slender and long and they're on a pole. And yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, very good. Uh, Katie Teets has more information about bat houses. Let me put that in the comments section right here and then post it onto the screen as well. So you can go to batcon.org, uh, I'm sorry, for more information about bat houses. That's a great resource. Thank you so much, Katie. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to float over to Fish and Wildlife uh, really quickly. So in case you guys are really supportive of your uh, of the people behind this, uh, biologists in general, people that support and want to make sure, and are good stewards of the environment, please go to support FWC. And this is just a simple Google search. Uh, here you can find ways to donate. Uh, you can buy a plate. They have license plates as well, gift ideas. And they also have options for youth to get involved. So you can get them interested in uh, the environment so they become better attuned voters uh, much later on in life. Um, Another good resource is Bat Week that Katie uh, touched on. So Bat Week is today's its final day. And as Katie mentioned, most of this stuff is going on online, but this is a great resource for you guys to get acquainted with, batweek.org. And this is one that Lisa was touching base on quite a bit. This is whitenosesyndrome.org. And you can actually find more information about the spread map, which was really, really cool. So I'm sure this is a very interactive, great visual for people to understand the seriousness of the matter. And it actually breaks down into counties, I can tell. And finally, uh, we have actually last two, uh, final, is fmps.org. So in case you guys are native plant lovers, please go to fps.org, you can find membership information. And then when you sign up, you can choose couple of firm from the drop down, especially if you happen to be in the region that we serve. Uh, and finally, Emily Stanford's uh, website is backbnb.org. Uh, they do back, back boxes, and then they also have resources. So you can find a bad education zone, there's uh, education by Merlin Tuttle, as well as other nonprofits. Um, so please explore those. And they're also listed in the chat box for you all. So, all right. And uh, Elizabeth finally wraps it up by saying, thank you for giving me your Saturday time. Yes, I am particularly thankful as well, Lisa and Katie. Thank you so much for your time and consideration and the knowledge that you've shared with us. So this is definitely for the record books. I appreciate it um had a lot of fun and we'll see you next time thanks a lot
Yep. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity and happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Bath Month. Happy October Native Plant Month. Yes. <laughs> yes, Peter Wright. Thank, thank you all. Great presentation as well. All right, folks. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.